Lord, please take from your word now and would you feed and nourish us, we ask, for Jesus' sake. Amen. I'm sure that one of the things that God is teaching us in this season as a church is to be prepared for conflict. After all, we have a devil who prowls around looking for someone to devour, and we're told in the scripture that we're in a spiritual battle. Last Sunday evening from Acts, uh, we looked at how Christ was handed over by God's deliberate foreknowledge, and that with the, that with the help of wicked men, he was nailed to the cross. So I spoke about the conflict Christ faced, and that we're not above him. PCC have been thinking about responding to false teaching in the denomination about human sexuality. And today we have this powerful passage about Christ. And again, it addresses conflict. Today we'll focus on one, the judgment Jesus longs for, and two, the division that is a natural consequence of the judgment. So first of all, one, the judgment that Jesus longs for. Verse 49, I have come to bring fire upon the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. Even prior to knowing what Jesus means by this, we're likely to feel uneasy with the sentiment of it. We're used to speaking of peace upon the earth rather than fire. Isn't that why we put so much time into our Christmas services and outreach? To see that fire refers to judgment, we can look at several passages. In Luke, we can turn earlier to chapter 3. We turn to Luke chapter 3 and verse none the axe has been laid to the root of the trees and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire we can also see examples of this in luke chapter 3 verse 17 and then luke 17 verses 28 to 29 why is it that jesus seems impatient to bring judgment upon the earth well in matthew 5 22 jesus refers to the fire of hell. And we need to think about what this is. In a very real sense, this is the fire that is prepared for the devil and his angels who fell from their relationship with God. Matthew 25 verse 41 makes this clear. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. We also recognize that in a sense, hell has begun now. The danger of saying this, of course, is that someone will think hell is not a real future place, just um, some kind of experience now. It is a future place, described in the Bible as a place of torment. It's also experienced in a small measure each time we sin. Don't you notice that some of the things that you do are hell-ish? They almost have the smell of smoke upon them because they're from that place. Think about what Jesus says about the tongue in James chapter 3. James is just after Hebrews, if you'd like to turn to that, and we'll look at that together. James chapter 3, beginning at verse 5. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire. A world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. I'm sure that you've experienced this as true. And when you did that thing that impacted you, spoke those words, didn't you wish that the world would not be so bitter and painful as it is? Didn't it seem to graffiti upon the face of everything that is beautiful? in that moment. Jesus longs to kindle the fire that will form the lake of fire referred to in Revelation 2015. And this is because this is because that will be the final removal of Satan and his angels, and they will be thrown there. Also because it will deal with the ugly sin that is in humanity and so wrecks us and our relationships. In other words, it doesn't undermine his love, but confirms it. The Bible is also clear that those who do not believe in Jesus for salvation will also be sent to hell. I cannot tell you the truth from scripture if I leave that out. If you're new to this, 
or if that causes you some pain as you hear that, as it should do for us all, look at what Jesus says must come before him kindling the fire. And it's in verse 50 of our reading. In verse 50, he speaks of his baptism, which he must undergo, which was a common way of referring to his death. It refers to the inundation of the flood waters of judgment at his death. And he says that he is under a constraint to complete that action first. So each time we have a baptism, we're remembering the flood waters that Moses led the people of Israel through. The children who discovered safety while the Egyptians were judged and the flood waters closed in on them. Jesus would not bring the judgment to us until there is a safe place for us to run if we wish to do that. I encourage you to do that. Consider this. How do we say that we fight fire? We say we fight fire with fire. We fight the fire of hell by going to the cross where the fire of judgment was poured out on Jesus. Hell has never been hotter than when it burned against the Son of God, when he took every sin that ever existed on himself to rescue all those who would believe, the sins of anger, hatred, lust, murder, abuse, unforgiveness. He bore it all in this event he referred to as the baptism he must undergo. The benefits of that come from believing and being baptised into his death, as Romans 6, 3 to 4 say. One of the ways they create a firebreak on the moorlands is to have a controlled area that is burnt. By burning the header in a controlled way, it prevents, um, should a wildfire occur, a much larger area having fire spread out of control. And in the same way, it is as if Jesus stands in the firebreak for us. He stands there as the crucified one with all his children, and where fire has burned once, it will not burn again. So before Jesus would kindle the fire that must cleanse the world of evil, he must first open up an escape route, a way of salvation. And if you can see it, please take it. I'd like to help you do that by pointing you to our website, our, where it says about us, and then what is Christianity, or you can get in touch with us. Secondly, the division that is a natural consequence of the judgment. Jesus did not promise a superficial peace that papers over the cracks. He did not promise peace but division. A division between the sheep and the goats, those on the narrow way and the broad, those walking in darkness, and those walking in the light. And he knows, verse 52, that this will divide families down the middle. In the very same family, one will choose to repent and believe, and another will not. Many experience a tension with unbelieving relatives over the deep matters of the gospel and who we are living for. It can be painful for the wife and husband, where maybe one was converted in later years and the other remained unconverted. If Jesus is the only way of salvation, then that means there are some who are not going to be saved. And that is a painful thing. If you're like me, you prefer the encouragement of being part of the Church of Christ and a Christian. We love the fellowship and the deep friendships that the gospel produces with those who are brothers and sisters. We love the encouragement we can give one another in times of trial, sweet words that lift one another up. The worship, preaching and teaching hopefully helps us. But this is only possible if we do the hard work of explaining and defending the truth. The way we do this is important and we only ever do it with gentleness and respect. We must not be divisive by acting in a way that brings shame on Jesus. The teaching that implies conflict, that implies conflict, exposes insecurity in me. I'm by nature ex exceptionally shy of conflict. It's a personality test during the week and it confirmed uh, that like most of us, I prefer, or like many of us, I prefer harmony in relationships, more focused on uh, relationships really than goals. But I need to learn from Jesus and to find my courage when it comes to needful conflict. We cannot escape conflict in the Bible. In fact, uh, it's, it's there right through it. In Luke's gospel, Luke has Jesus being born out of wedlock. Christ is born into controversy, in other words. John the Baptist has Jesus pictured with his winnowing fork in his hand to clear his threshing floor. He's tested in the wilderness where he enters conflict with the devil. Jesus chooses to confront untruth, injustice, idolatry, and sin, to name but a few things. And conflict has the uncanny knack 
of searching him out. So let us see again the kind of waters that Jesus swam in. We might imagine that Jesus came to bring tranquility upon the earth. Well, he will bring peace upon the earth ultimately. This was not the aim at his coming. And it's not the sort of ride he warns his followers they're in for. It can be uncomfortable to talk with people about the claims of Christ and about where people are heading. It can be uncomfortable to have a different opinion on the Bible and for one to order their life around it and another not to do so. So why is it that the Prince of Peace is also the Prince of Division? If it's true for families, what about in communities, churches, denominations, religious groups? Reg Burroughs in his book, Dare to Contend, says, No church or denomination has ever been won back from apostasy and unbelief except by confrontation. Gospel confrontation is not all that is necessary for the spiritual health of the church, but without it there is no extension of the kingdom of God. Without it, dead churches cannot come alive. That's why we revere the godly men of the past, Martin Luther, John Calvin, John Knox. We make the mistake of thinking that we can have the spiritual fruit like theirs without the pain of battle. On the issue of human sexuality, we must be prepared to stand for the truth of the Bible and to make hard decisions because God has called us to contend for his truth. It's something actually that all of the baptised must do. We say at baptism, fight valiantly as a disciple of Christ against sin, the world and the devil and remain faithful to Christ all the days of your life. Ours is a spiritual battle, not against flesh and blood. The thing about an idol is they have a very strong hold on people. Every soldier in the field of battle knows they will sustain wounds. Reg Burroughs says, you cannot infiltrate principalities and powers without a serious fight on your hands, nor can you withdraw and hope they will go away. You must fight. In fact, one book on contending in the Church of England is called simply Fight Valiantly. You see, Elijah was called by God to go into contest with the 450 prophets of Baal. God used Elijah to show that the prophets of Baal were worthless God, uh, worshipped worthless gods. It was a battle for the souls of the men and women who looked on. And that is what we have today. We will have to draw attention to error and to appropriately challenge it. But like us, Elijah knows that the battle is not his. Ultimately, it is a battle between the false gods and the living God. If people are going to be one to truth, there has to be a confrontation of truth and error. We lovingly apply the gospel, repenting where we must, keeping watch over ourselves and the flock. The reason is not one of unkindness, but because of the kindness of God. In PCC, we've been looking at what it means to contend. And one of the places to see that is in Jude, the second last book of the Bible. It says to contend, not in order to upset people, but be merciful to those who doubt. Save others by snatching them from the fire. To others show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. We contend not in order to be difficult. For example, if St John's takes a public stand, as Bishop Rob Munro is encouraging us uh, to do, to clarify our own position and to clarify what false teaching is, and to put distance between ourselves and those who teach error. That is not to be difficult, but in order to be obedient to God. Perhaps we never thought how hard the Christian life would be. Being prepared to be unpopular is part of the active, vital gospel work by which we stand for Christ. Staying out of error and knowing it's never too late for anyone while the breath of life is still in them. Jesus said, woe to you when everyone speaks well of you. But that is how their ancestors treated the false prophets. The fact that we experience some opposition does not mean that we're doing something wrong necessarily in a world where Jesus is passionate about bringing his judgment. We walk in the way of Jesus, who on the pathway to peace said that there must be division.